Hey, I'm Siobhan Williams, and you're watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi everyone, it's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press, and today I'm happy to be joined by Siobhan Williams. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. How are you, Chloe? I'm doing good. Thanks for joining me today. As you mentioned, you had a bit of a morning. Uh, yeah. But we'll talk about um, kittens a bit later. Cool. Let's start with uh, a project you've been busy with. Um, let's start with actually with Welcome to Marwin. You did some motion capture work as French milkmaid doll Elsa yeah. in the film. Tell me a bit about your experience working on it. Oh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I went into it having done a little bit of uh, motion capture because I worked on a game for a few years, um, but I'd never done anything like what Zemeckis came up with for the movie, which is basically like a, a composited um, motion capture and real life um, unanimated uh, kind of stitched together. So it was really neat because we had all of the normal camera gear and equipment and lighting that you'd have like on a film set, but then we also had um, all of the the gear and technology from motion capture, so it was it was pretty wild. <laughs> and your hair looked impeccable in the film. And you know, also <laughs> French braids, and people uh, who were watching Ellen got to see it when Steve Carell was on. You posted that screenshot how you could see a still where your character was in it with um, yeah. Steve Carell's character. Nice surprise to wake up to. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I guess I've made it on Ellen. <laughs> but unofficially, yeah. Hopefully in the future you'll be sitting in the hot seat, but that was pretty cool. Um, a step towards that, of course, could be your current project, Deadly Class. Um, you play Brandy Lynn. She is the leader of the Dixie Mob at King's mm -hmm. Dominion. She's a legacy. Rick Remender has said that she is one of the most dangerous characters in the comics, so what's it like bringing her to life? Yeah. I mean, it's really a mixed bag. I was going to say it's an honor, um, but then she's such a complex and... Um, kind of despicable character. Um, so it's really, really interesting for me um, to play a villain again because I, I've i played villains before but it's usually very much at a high school level. Like, it's like the worst they're gonna do is, you know, make you just feel really bad about yourself whereas Brandy's actually like a dangerous, murderous, true villain. Um, so it's it's really fun. Like, she's, she's so confident. She's so different from myself. Um, she has a lot of really horrific qualities that aren't enjoyable to play and aren't enjoyable to research, unfortunately. Like, she's a white supremacist, so I've been watching documentaries on, like, um, Nazi communities in the South, in the States, that you watch and you're like, oh my god, <laughs> I can't believe people live like this or think these things, but it's been enlightening, to say the least, um, and, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely cool though, on the other hand, to play a character who's so confident and so physically um, elite, I guess. Like, she yeah. could kill anybody. Like Rick said, she's one of the most dangerous at the school. So. Well, I think you've done uh, an incredible job playing her so far. Hope oh. to dive into at least more of her backstory to see where this has come from as the series goes on. Um, you each receive curated playlists. Mm -hmm. um, I know you said before Patsy Cline. Yeah. So you really love music. How did you use this playlist to shape your mindset going into season one? Oh man, I loved it. That was such a great resource that Rick made for all of us. Um, and when we started the pilot, I was listening to the playlist a lot. Um, there was some music on there that I just couldn't get behind. <laughs> like, I'm from Alberta, don't get me wrong, like, country totally has its place, um, but it's probably the genre of music I listen to the least. Um, so, like, uh, listening to Hank Williams Jr. and stuff, like, bless him, um, it's not my vibe. Patsy Klein, on the other hand, I adore. So, some of the kind of more croony uh, music I love, and I like that Brandy's tastes are almost more like 60s, 70s than, right. than the traditional punk 80s. Um, but in addition to that, I've been a music fan far longer than I've been like a TV and film fan. Um, so it's really cool to be part of a show where music is so important. Um, and it's such a huge distinction within the show of, of creating a tone and um, a nostalgia that a lot of people experience. Um, and luckily my boyfriend's a musician and he's like the most educated in 80s and, and punk and all that stuff. So. Um, I've been listening to a lot of, and I was in I was in the punk scene in the 2000s when I was in high school, um, so I could, you know, 
move kind of a piece lot of together. That. The show's done, as, as you mentioned, a really good job incorporating that music. Another yeah. dimension of that is, of course, so much fierce girl power between yourself, Taylor, Marie, Alana, Erica, um, the amazing stunt actresses. So what's it like coming to work on a show where, you know, all these female characters really hold their own? Oh, it's so great. It's, it's really cool. Um, I also love that so much of the cast has been cast from Vancouver too, like not not to segue back, but I'll go back to what you said really quickly, but like Liam James, Sean Deppner, Isaiah, Jack, myself, Taylor, we're all Vancouver locals and it's so rare that Vancouver actors actually get the chance to be cast in leading roles. So often we're the guest star or we're the, the like number 14 on the cast list who's right. like a bit part. Um, but it's crazy to see such a strong, character-driven ensemble cast of people that just shine. I think it really brings to light Vancouver talent. Going back to what you said, um, yeah, it's it's amazing. Like, all these women are so individual and independent, and they're all physically so capable and emotionally and mentally so capable and really, in my opinion, I think are stronger than the males in the show. Um, I know I'm not the first person to say that. Um, not in terms of acting, but in terms of their characters and yeah. what they accomplish. Um, and uh, it's really neat. It's just so cool. Like Lana and Marie and I had one day where we had a stunt scene all together, the three of us, and we'd all had separate stunt rehearsals. And that's actually in the next episode. I was going to say, yeah. yeah, all the stills. You can see Randy coming back. And yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. So that's really, really fun. And we all just support each other so much. And it's amazing that we get along so well. Like, just goes to show, I think. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you're behind the Deadly Class fundraiser um, for FOCRA, mm -hmm. um, amazing organization, 100% no kill. Tell me a bit about how this came about. So um, I've been working with VOCRA for about three and a half years. Um, I've been volunteering and fostering uh, mainly. My boyfriend and I, we've fostered almost 40 cats with them in the last few years. And um, over the years, I've just come to kind of be at their operative center more and more and kind of see the women who run it um, and learned their stories and kind of how they came to, to be and um, their policies and mandates. And uh, it's just made me realize what a unique organization they are. I've volunteered with other nonprofits, like I volunteered at the SPCA and um, and then we have Foundation in Calgary and, and different things, but Voker is just so unique because the women who run it, um, primarily Karen Duncan, Maria, and Cassie, they just, like, they have no lives outside of, like, 24-7, they're on their phones, they, they don't get paid, they're, like, volunteers, you know, but it's literally an eight day, days a week job, um, and they run everything, and then there's, like, I think something like 600 foster parents in the Lower Mainland, um, and I've just never seen a rescue that's so adamant about care. Like when I worked at a SPCA, um, or when I volunteered with the dogs there, like I saw way too many dogs get put down that should not have been put down. Um, for a nonprofit organization that says that they'll only euthanize, you know, if a dog's in like acute pain or poses a, a security issue to the public. I've seen dogs that would have been okay with a few weeks of training, but were like one or two years old and they were like, it's not worth our reputation. Which I understand, like I understand that they have a responsibility to the public and that they have, you know, a very wide reaching title that they have to maintain. Like they're also involved in agriculture and, and all sorts of things. Um, but luckily Vokra, because they're such a small niche um, business, they're able to really, uh, you know, focus on what they do best, which is basically keeping all of the cats alive. And then, yeah. Um, so then in terms of a fundraiser, um, both Maria, the Gabrielle Faria, and I are avid animal lovers, um, as you know, and I'm sure you are too, <laughs> given how much we talk about this. Um, I, uh, I've done a few fundraisers before, I'd never done one for Vokra, um, but I thought maybe it would be cool to um, see if she wanted to team up, because she saw that I was trying to raise money for Vokra, and she said, I wonder if we could get the cast involved and, you know, make something happen, and I thought, yeah, that's great. So. I reached out to um, the showrunners like Rick and Miles and asked if they would want to provide some sort of incentive for people to donate and Rick so kindly donated 25 copies of the comic, um, the first volume, and uh, and we got the whole cast to autograph them and then we decided to start running this fundraiser where uh, donations buy you raffle tickets and uh, it's been going since November now and uh, we're gonna go until the very last episode so we'll do the draw 
um, probably on the day the last episode airs, I would imagine. Um, we've made $2,500 so far. And yeah, I hope people continue to donate. <laughs> yeah, hopefully more to come. It's mm -hmm. amazing that a show can get behind, obviously, a cause that you are so passionate about and kind of bring that to light and provide yeah. incentives for that. Um, so let's talk a bit more about music. Yeah. Um, so Mariah Scary and the Ghoulish Cauldrons, <laughs> um, Where Will Valentine video just dropped before Valentine's Day. Tell me a bit about working on this video. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. <laughs> Definitely not your typical love story, but it's very intriguing. Oh, cool. Thank Thank you, thanks for watching it. Um, yeah, it was fun. So, uh, my boyfriend Steve. Um, Juno nominated. Juno, um, not yet. He's nominated for Engineer of the Year this year, so he's really excited. Um, and he was nominated as an artist for Hot Hot Heat, the band he was in before, um, but never as a like a tech behind the scenes. So, he's excited about that. Um, so, him and his friend um, Carrie Pratt, who have uh, he has another band, um, Prairie Cat, which is his solo project. Yeah. Um, they decided to start this fun kind of hobby side project called Mariah Scary and the Ghoulish Cauldrons and it's basically um, a Halloween themed band that only writes songs about holidays other than Halloween and uh, he came up with this is their second single Werewolf Valentine and Sarah um, Sarah Lemon and I we were listening to it and we were just super inspired and we were like what about this what about this and he was like the song comes out in a week and a half I'm pretty sure we are not gonna have time for a video we were like but what if we just what if you know and um, Sarah came up with a treatment and we were like, all right, I guess we're doing this. So um, Sarah, myself, Steve and Carrie uh, basically just like spent two days filming in Capilano. Uh, like, and the first night we filmed was the first night that it snowed. And we were like, I feel like, so we started filming at 5 p.m. And then by, we finished around 7 a.m. And all of us were doing everything. So like, Myself, Carrie, and Steve were all on camera, but also operating camera when right. we weren't in it. <laughs> operating fog, operate like moving the lights. I was doing all the blood makeup and getting Steve's contacts in, which took a very, very long time because he's never worn contacts before. <laughs> you were like trying to open his eyes. Yeah, yeah stay open. I was like, stay open. He's like, okay, I am. And then his eye would be like, and I was like, no, you gotta. <laughs> he's like, I'm trying. It's a reflex or cut. Um, so it was really interesting, but um. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I I'd love to do more stuff like that. I love I love operating camera and I love um, cinematography and photography and lighting. So it was a great opportunity for me. Yeah. And you have directed a video before um, Hot Hot Heat's Magnitude. Mm, so yeah. That. I know you mentioned in another interview you are passionate about singing. Have you ever thought about collaborating on a duet or something like that? Um, you know, it's funny actually. Mariah Scary's first song I did backup vocals on. Um, spooky Christmas. If you listen to it, you'll hear me, I think, on the bridge. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we totally have. We've actually co-written some songs together. We've just never finished any of them because we get really passionate and then he gets requested for some job and I get requested for some job and it's like, then we forget about it. Um, but one day we'll finish something. Yeah, I think. hopefully. Looking forward to hearing it. Um, you're obviously very talented. Um, hopefully we can hear more. I don't know if you write originals by yourself as well. Um, I have. Not in a while, but I have probably like 50 songs that have just kind of disappeared on a hard drive. <laughs> Maybe like when you're not working with acting, you are probably just pour yourself into music or something like that. Yeah. Okay, now we have a fun question for you to end uh -oh. things off. So if you were to make it into the Guinness Book of World Records for something, what would it be? There's some pretty Whoa. interesting things in there, so. Oh my gosh. Um, longest sleep? <laughs> longest nap? <laughs> Which would be, oh, I mean, I've never really tested how long I could nap for, but I could sleep for like a solid 17 hours. Like, without trying. If I was <laughs> trying, maybe a day. <laughs> I don't and know. then you'd be like, I have to get out of bed now. Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty good one. Hey, it could happen. Or maybe, like, most rescue animals. Like, if I had my way, I'd love to just have a mansion and a property with, like, all You've of the dogs. You've had quite a few. You said, um, like, kittens at one time in your place. Yeah, we've had, like, six kittens at once. And then their mom. <laughs> so seven cats. But they're miniatures. The only count is, like, a half. Recorder. And it's it's not a job as you mentioned you yeah. do doing it so yeah yeah it's so selfish <laughs> I love it you just get all of the love and cuddles it's awesome awesome well thank you yeah. so much Siobhan for taking the time to chat really appreciate yeah, it so we'll be posting um Siobhan's social media links below um check her out in Deadly Class Wednesdays on Sci-Fi and Space Channel and we will see you next time thanks.